All right, so we've defined those terms. Again, assets, what I value, vulnerability is a weakness, threat is um, has the potential to harm my asset. Now, some, um, oh, and an exploit is when that happens, that point in time where a threat exploits or exposes a vulnerability and causes loss to the asset. Now, it's interesting because different documents will define risk differently. Um, and even more interesting is two different ISO documents. International Organization of Standards has two different documents that define risks differently. That can always be fun. But with ISO 31000, they essentially say that risk is neither positive nor negative. If any of you have gone through the PMP exam certification, project management professional, um, project management says, you know, a positive unknown or positive risk is an opportunity. A negative risk is a threat. So that's okay. But in this class, our risks will be considered negative. But I do want you to know as you expand and you go to other courses, you look at other certifications, that may change. That may be, that may vary. And the idea behind saying risk can be either positive or negative really is the fact that if all we do is look at the potential for negative and we don't ever examine the potential for gain, we're going to be very skewed towards loss, right? But sometimes, you know, if, if we look at the inherent value of some things that we're doing, yeah, there may be the potential for loss, but there may also be the potential for gain. And when we're doing true risk management, we have to weigh both options. All right, but let's do some more definitions. So as I mentioned, we talked about probability and likelihood of risk, right? And when we look at that risk potential, the idea is there's always a certain degree of risk with everything. I mean, even getting out of bed in the morning, there's a degree of risk with, especially if you're 48. There's a certain degree of risk with just getting out of bed. So when we look at that risk, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to eliminate most risks entirely. We're just going to be able to bring down the amount of risk. So we start out with the inherent risk. What's there before you do anything? That can also sometimes be called the total risk. So they may use total risk and inherent risk interchangeably. But there's just always a certain amount of risk. Well, what our job is, is to mitigate or lessen that risk. But how far? How much mitigation is enough? And the phrase that you want to have is we want to mitigate risk until what's left over is acceptable. Okay? We're going to mitigate risk until the amount of risk that's left over, which is called residual risk. So my job is to mitigate risk until the residual risk is acceptable to senior management. That's my job. Okay, now, so residual risk, what's left over? There are some risks, well, I won't even get into that yet. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. That's a teaser for something we're going to talk about later. Oh, and it's so cool. Okay, so residual risk, the amount of risk that's left over. Often you have to mitigate, 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 mitigate until the point, you know, rarely is one form of mitigation going to bring your risk all the way down to where it's acceptable to senior management. We often have to apply multiple mitigation strategies. All right, and then the term secondary risk. A secondary risk is... One risk response can cause a second risk event. Fix one problem just to cause another. Um, I think of this because every now and then, it usually there's a period of time where I consider myself to be handy around the house. I will go on record as saying I am not handy around the house, but I tend to think that I am for a while. So I get out my toolkit. I should never be allowed to have a toolkit. Certainly no power tools. Um, and I try to fix something around the house. The most recent episode of this was our um, toilet was running. And that little running noise, it's a waste of water. It's annoying. So I was like, look, I'll just go down to Home Depot. I've got a set of pliers. Got a hacksaw if I need one. I don't even know what I would need a hacksaw for in this instance. But by God, I had it. 
And so the toilet was no longer running. And then that night I was downstairs watching television and the dreaded question, what's that sound that sounds like water running? And I turned around, swear to you, not making this up. It was like I had installed a water fountain, one of those really cool water fountains where it just comes down the wall. That's what was happening in my basement. Made a little mistake. Could have been the hacksaw. I don't know. So I fixed the problem. The toilet was no longer running. Unfortunately, water had flooded the basement, basically, because of some reconfiguration. In the IT world, you patch a system. There's a security vulnerability. You apply a patch that shores up the weakness. But then, if that patch hasn't been thoroughly tested, that patch could cause the system to shut down, to reboot, to no longer be compatible. Sometimes I've had patches cause individual programs not to run. There are just all sorts of possibilities. You fix one problem just to cause another. What you have to do for secondary risks is you have to play out the tape, so to speak. So yeah, I'm going to fix this problem, but then what's the potential risk based on this new configuration? So I can make a change, but then the chance that that change may cause a problem, often we don't go that far and think things through. Okay, two terms that get uh, confused and misused all the time. Risk appetite and risk tolerance. Now, when we talk about risk appetite, this is senior management's philosophy on risk. How much risk are we willing to take? And a lot of times that's qualitative. Okay, we are a very risk averse organization. We don't want to be involved in anything controversial. We don't want to take any risks. Slow and steady wins the race. This is the way we do business. You often see organizations um, in the financial industries, not all, you know, some financial organizations roll the dice and they're very risk aggressive. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. But when you think about banks traditionally, um, credit card companies, because the value of what they're protecting is so high, they may choose to be very risk averse. Or you may see an organization, like I said, risk seeking. Because really, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So if you're one of those people that goes to Vegas and you pay penny slot, play penny slots all night until you lose $5, you're risk averse. If you're one of those folks that wants to go to Vegas with me, you're probably risk seeking. You're also probably poor, but that's another story. Okay? And sometimes the company's just risk neutral. We don't really have a stance on risk, but we weigh it on a case by case basis. Okay, so risk appetite comes from your governing entities like senior managers, board of directors. All right, now within that risk appetite, I may have variances. For instance, if we look at Tesla, they're in the news quite a bit now for various reasons, but I would certainly say Tesla is very much a risk seeking enterprise. You know, if you're trying to launch a vehicle off a rocket, in space, you're probably willing to take some risks there. Agreed? So they're a very risk-seeking organization. However, because their self-driving vehicles have been involved in several fatal crashes, now their risk tolerance for anything revolving around loss of human life is very, very small. So they're risk-seeking as a whole, except in matters revolving around human life, so their risk tolerance is very low. Now it may be very high elsewhere, but the tolerance is very low. So a lot of times they'll talk about um, the variation within the overall risk appetite for risk tolerance. All right, and then risk threshold. The risk threshold is the upper limit for the amount of risk you're willing to subject yourself to. It is almost always a quantifiable boundary we will not go over this amount of exposure. So at a certain point within an organization, we may say, um, we're going to try this new strategy. We're going to monitor the strategy. We're going to see if it's effective. At a certain point in time, if we see our stocks decline below 5%, that is no longer acceptable. We're going to pull the plug and we're going to do something different, right? That's our tolerance. That's our risk threshold. We've exceeded our threshold at that point in time. 
All right, and then we talked about mitigating risks earlier. How do we mitigate risks? We mitigate risks with controls. So when we talk about controls, we're talking about physical or technical or administrative controls that we put in place to mitigate risks. So encryption is a control, a firewall is a control, locking a door is a control, separation of duties as a policy is a control. Anything that we implement to try to mitigate risk, those are all controls.